Tales from the Break Room is a podcast where real people share their scariest work stories. And I want to hear yours. Send us your story at eeriecast.com slash submit. And if we feature it on the show, we'll pay you five cents per word. PayPal only. While you're at it, leave Tales from the Break Room a rating or review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? At one point or another in our careers, we all look at someone and think, at least I don't do that for a living. But that same thing has likely been said about you. Today's stories will make you think the same thing, but they might also make you wonder what sort of horrifying or awful things you might run to on your job one day. Well, time for my coffee break, and we both know what that means. New true scary work stories. Enjoy. These are tales from the break room. Once upon a time in retail, from That EDM Girl. This is an experience I had while working retail in the 2010s. I was in my early 20s, and I'd found a great adult job working for a cellular provider store. I won't name the company, but just think of the color blue, and I'm sure you can piece it together. Being a petite 5 foot 1, 100 pound girl makes me quite small and often mistaken for being younger than I actually was. Luckily, store policy required no less than two people to close the store if you ended up on a closing shift. The closing shifts at this particular store went until 9, so more often than not, you'd be on your way home nearing 10 or later if a special customer came in needing a quick upgrade. Upgrades at the time were never quick, requiring transferring data from one device to another. Keep in mind, this was 2010, so most folks were just starting to transition into their first smartphone. This would take a while, as we had to provide basics on how to even use the new device. I can remember one closing shift with a colleague. It was a particularly dead night. Whenever this happened, we tried our best to complete closing duties earlier, like vacuuming the store, cleaning the tables and counters, and anything else we could do beforehand. My colleague, Scott, was busy cleaning the counter, and I was watching the door in case a customer came in. A customer did walk in at 8.50pm, 10 minutes before we closed for the night. Great, I thought, another quick upgrade, right before locking the front door. What a joy. But externally, I said, Hey, welcome to Blue, how can we help you tonight? I need help said an older man sporting a thick coat and hat. This was suspicious. It was still 80 degrees in September in Florida. Definitely not a tire you'd wear comfortably. Yeah, sure, we can help. What do you need assistance with? I asked, trying to not let my friendly, helpful demeanor crack into irritated and suspicious screams internally. Well, started the man, jamming his hand into his coat. Thinking he was going to pull out a phone, I sighed, knowing I was about to have to help him with his situation. This phone isn't working right, he said, grabbing the device and shoving it inches from my face. Oh, um, uh, what's wrong with it? I asked, taking a step back. It won't let me send pictures, he said, stepping forward again, invading my space. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Can you show me what happens when you try to send a picture? I asked, taking another step back. At this point, my colleague had directed his attention to our interaction, cocking his head a bit to signal to the man that he wasn't alone with me in the building. The man huffed. Uh, can't you just show me why it's not working? His attitude changed from odd to mildly annoyed, when he noticed my coworker's subtle movements. I'm happy to help, but can you show me what's going on exactly? I asked again. Well, it's late. I'm sure you want to get home. What time do you open tomorrow? He changed his demeanor again. We open at 9am, I smiled. Will you 
be here? We will be here, I said cheerfully. No, no, will you be here? He asked, taking his phone and putting it back into his pocket. I'll be in at eleven, I said, shrugging my shoulders. Ah, good, good, I'll see you then, he said, turning around and heading for the door. After the man got into his car, my coworker and I discussed his odd behavior and closed up shop. We finished our closing duties and walked out together after he set the alarm. Hey Kay, he said to me after locking the door. Yeah? Be sure to let the manager know if that guy does come in tomorrow. He seemed really off. I smiled. It'll be fine. Good night, Scott. I'll see you tomorrow. I got into my car and headed home. As you can gather from me writing this, it wasn't fine the next day, or even in the weeks after, for that matter. My shift the following day started busy, as was typical for that time of day with more traffic. People coming in on their lunch breaks, people needing to pay their phone bills. You get the picture. As I clocked in, a coworker approached me. We'll call her Heather. Hey, you got a customer needing a call back, she told me, handing me a sticky note. We did this to maintain report with customers and encourage repeat business, since most of the money we made was commissions. Ah, okay, thanks. I'll get to this after we deal with the madness out there. I laughed, pointing out to the sales floor. Heather chuckled, heading out as I glanced at the sticky note. It said, Bin and had a number written on it. Ben, I thought, as I hadn't worked recently with any customers named Ben. No matter, I shoved the sticky note in my pocket and headed out. The next few hours went smoothly, helping one customer with emails, helping another add a line to their account. Nothing out of the ordinary. We eventually slowed down in the mid-afternoon when I heard a voice behind me. Hey Kay, Ben is here to see you. It was Heather. I had just finished up with another customer. Okay, tell him I'll be just a moment. I smiled over my shoulder. Heather nodded and walked to the front door. I finished with my current customer after a few more minutes and headed over to Ben. Hey, sorry Ben, how can I... Looking up, it was the same man who had come in ten minutes before closing the night before. I still can't send the picture. He looked annoyed. Why didn't you call me? He stepped forward. Oh, I'm sorry. We were pretty slammed all afternoon. This is the first time we've slowed down. Let me help you over here. I gestured to the counter. His look soured. Can you please just fix this? He handed me his Motorola Razor. What picture did you want to send? Let's see what happens, I said, taking the phone. This one. He pulled up a picture of a nude woman in bondage and a gag. I felt my cheeks flush a little red as he pointed out the picture. Uh, okay, so you uh, click on this. Now, who do you want to send this to? I asked trying to remain composed. Jimmy, I want to send this to my friend Jimmy. He stated, matter-of-factly. Okay, so we have to scroll down to your contacts to the Jays, I said, still assisting him. You know, you remind me of a model. Have you ever modeled? He asked. Nope, I'm not a model. Okay, found him, I said, trying to change the subject. Now you just tap send. Did you want to send him a text as well? I asked, hovering my finger over the button. No, he'll get what I mean. He winked at me. This was getting uncomfortable. Okay, it's sent, I smiled, looking up from the phone at him. He just nodded, smiling. Ah, there it goes. Thank you, young lady. His smile seemed eerie in the moment. 
Um, no problem. Anything else I can help you with? I asked, inching away. Yes, I think there may be, he responded. I held my breath, anticipating what would likely come out of his mouth next. Your number, in case I need you again. He winked once more. It was common for customers to ask for my number, whether for professional reasons or personal relationship reasons. Luckily, the company provided a phone for this very reason, instead of using my personal one. Sure, here's my business card. I handed him my card. My number's right here. I underlined the business number and handed it to him. Ah, thank you, sweetheart. You've been a doll. He put the card in his pocket and headed for the door. I sighed in relief that he was out of my hair. For now. The next day I was working with Scott again and filled him in on Ben from the other night and what happened yesterday, since Scott had asked upon clocking in. A few hours into my shift I got a text. See you later. I shrugged it off since I often got messages like that on my work phone. Sure enough, around early evening, Ben walked in. Why, hello, Kay. I need some help again. He smiled, coming through the door. Hey, I smiled. Scott looked over at me through his customer, giving me an, I'm here if you need me, nod. What can I help you with today? I asked. Well, he jammed his hands, grabbing his razor again. It seems I can't take pictures. He handed me the phone again. That's odd. I took it and opened the camera. Yes, it's the darndest thing, he smiled. I was able to access the camera options just fine. Ben, it seems to be working today. Here, take a look. I handed the phone back to him and demonstrated it was operational. Ah, oh, well, look at that, he smiled. You know, I'm a photographer. I could always take pictures of you if you'd like. He continued to grin, doing something on his phone. Here, some of my work. The picture showed yet another nude woman. Oh, that's... I struggled to find words. Oh, yeah, she's a model, you know. He winked at me again. Oh, and this one. He scrolled through, showing me yet another nude blonde woman. I just nodded, my smile fading to a straight line. Well, that's something, Ben. I managed. Think about it. He then walked out the door. At that point, I didn't know what to do. The next week was a blur of Ben texting my business line and randomly showing up at the store with bogus issues ranging from how to turn his phone off to adding a contact to showing me more model pictures. Finally, my manager had to get involved after asking why he kept coming in. I explained what was happening, that I didn't want the store getting a bad reputation for customer service, so I've been putting up with it. She nodded and told me, Don't worry, Kay, next time he comes in about a problem, let me know. I'll take care of it. I thanked her and finished my shift. Two days later, Ben came in again. At this point, it had been going on for weeks. Luckily, my manager was working. I went to the back to inform her that Ben had arrived. Okay, Kay, I'll be right there, she told me. Just stay in the back. Let me handle him. I nodded and she headed out. I watched the security camera screen as my manager greeted Ben, asking how she could help. He abruptly asked where I was, insisting he knew I was here and that he knew what was going on. My manager explained any of us could assist him, but Ben wasn't having it. He began to yell and stomp around, demanding to speak to the manager and me about his issue. She warned him his behavior was alarming and he'd have to leave if he didn't stop. He stood there for a moment, unsure what to do. I listened closely. I'll blow this whole place up. 
don't think I won't. He raged. Thankfully, Scott was already on the phone with the police. Ben threw his phone and trashed the place, hurling phone cases, chargers, and accessories around while demanding to speak to me. Soon enough, the cops arrived and escorted Ben out without incident. He tried telling officers we had stolen his phone and were being unreasonable. We all had to fill out tedious incident reports after. When the police left, we found Ben's phone. Scott had to call them back to collect it as evidence. Scott took a quick look. Scott apparently found hundreds of photos of nude girls and women on it. I didn't look. Scott described what he saw. Days later, police interviewed me, asking if I was among the hundreds of female photos on Ben's phone. I assured them the only place I'd seen Ben was at work. They thanked me and said they'd open up an investigation beyond his violent store visit. I never knew for sure, but rumor was those phone photos were all victims of assault by Ben. Looking up past and present criminal suspects, as you can in our state, it turns out Ben was a convicted offender. I'll never forget Ben's disturbing rage and creepiness. It stuck with me throughout my retail career. Over a decade has passed since the incident. I'm grateful every day for the supportive co-workers and manager I had back then. Without them, who knows how long Ben's harassment would have continued or even escalated. Like so many other stories out there, the moral seems to be, trust your gut, and if possible, confide in others who can help if needed. It's always better to risk overreacting than wonder, what if? Bizarre Animal Control Encounter From Bob Matt I'll never forget the call that sent me out to that decrepit house on the edge of town two years ago. As an animal control officer, I was used to responding to some weird scenes, but nothing could prepare me for what I saw that night, and what saw me. It still gives me chills thinking back on it today. I had been working for the county about five years when I got the call on a Friday evening. Our dispatcher said a man had just phoned 911 reporting some kind of coyote or dog attack at his home. He claimed the animal was still lurking around his property when he called. The address she gave was way out in the sticks, an area I wasn't too familiar with, but she assured me the county database had it listed as an active residence. I hopped in the truck and headed out, bringing along a catch pole and tranquilizer gun just in case. About 15 minutes later, I pulled down the long dirt driveway the dispatcher had indicated. Right away, something seemed off. The house was a decrepit old trailer that looked abandoned. The property was completely overgrown, and the driveway hadn't seen a car in ages based on the foliage sprouting up through cracks. I parked and cautiously approached the trailer. No lights were on inside, and tapping on the door got no response. Peering through a dusty window, it was empty except for some garbage and an old sofa. Definitely no one living there. Confused and unnerved, I headed back to my truck to radio the dispatcher. But as I passed by a shed on the property, I heard a strange guttural snarl from somewhere nearby. I turned to look, shifting my tranquilizer rifle into ready position. A shape darted from behind the shed, too quick for me to get a good look. But it was the size of a large dog or wolf, completely hairless and pale. It disappeared into the overgrown field behind the trailer, though I could still hear it snarling. I know how dangerous a cornered, possibly rabid animal can be, but something compelled me to pursue this thing on foot, like I had to see it up close. I crept through the knee-high weeds, rifle aimed where I had seen it disappear. The thing stayed just out of sight, its sporadic snarls and the rustling of vegetation giving away that it was close. Then it went quiet, and that's when the hair stood up on my neck. I realized, in my focus on what was in front, I had lost track of my surroundings. Whipping around, I came face to face with it merely feet away. Crouched low to the ground was a canine-like creature the size of a wolf, but hairless and sinewy like some grotesque lab experiment. 
flesh pink, but also oddly human-toned. Its eyes were brightly colored but glazed, and the mouth was full of jagged teeth jutting in odd directions. We stared at each other, both tense and still. Then it reared up on muscular hind legs, standing at almost my height. The sheer wrongness of the thing paralyzed me momentarily. That was all the time it needed to spring forward, claws outstretched toward my face. I snapped out of it and ducked, just as it lunged, feeling its hot breath on my neck. I hit the ground hard as the thing sailed over me, screeching. I scrambled to my feet and sprinted for the shed, fumbling to ready my tranquilizer. The animal came bounding after me on just two legs. I fired a dart blindly behind me, hearing it yelp as the shot connected. I didn't slow to see if the tranquilizer was having an effect. Reaching my truck, I leapt inside and tore down the long driveway. My heart hammered as I sped away, watching in the rear view for any sign of pursuit. The dense woods lining the road seemed to take on a sinister vibe but the only thing in my mirrors was a cloud of dust dissipating down the empty dirt road. I pulled over once I reached the highway, finally catching my breath. Fumbling for the radio, I called dispatch trying to make sense of what I had seen. The dispatcher was confused, saying no call had come from that address. She asked if I was sure that was the location I had gone to. I didn't know what to think at that point. All I could do was file an incident report with animal control describing the bizarre hairless creature. Over the next week, officers returned to the property and set up cameras hoping to capture the thing on film. But they found nothing and no further sightings were ever reported. Part of me wishes we could have caught it just to prove I wasn't crazy, but another part hopes that Dart was enough to kill the abomination or at least drive it far away from humanity. I handed in my resignation the next week Deciding a quiet desk job was better for my nerves. I know the events of that night sound unbelievable, but when you come face to face with something so unnatural, it has a way of cracking open your sense of reality. Even now, driving at night when the woods press in close, I find myself scanning the darkness for any flash of pallid flesh and glinting eyes. Some things you can never unsee, no matter how hard you try to rationalize them. All I can do is hope to never again cross paths with the horrors that roam the boundaries where civilization ends. Drooling Deer From Trenchcoat Badger This story contains descriptions of animal illness, injury, and death. I work three jobs, two being remote at the time. The remote work means I'm often in town to use reliable internet at a local store, since I've got bad cell service and no Wi-Fi at home. It's a quiet parking lot the store's management allows me to work in. Even after the sun goes down, it's a safe enough looking place, what with it always being well lit and having good surveillance cameras. This is important because most of my colleagues are in different time zones, and collaboration means late nights, or early mornings for some of us. A few nights ago, I was on a call for my remote job, letting my car warm up for the last few minutes of the meeting. It was just starting to get cold, being late September. I suddenly noticed movement at the edge of the parking lot, and there was a deer weaving between parked cars. Immediately, red flags started going off in my mind. I grew up in a family of hunters, and I myself have hunted in the past to put food on the table for myself and my family. That said, I'm deeply familiar with normal whitetail and mule deer behavior. This deer, a whitetail doe, was shaking, drooling, staggering in looping circles. One circle, two, three, on and on. She moved in tight circles with unsteady steps, her head cocked off to the side, she looked pained, unnatural. Badger? You listening, Badger? My supervisor asked. I had been so absorbed watching the deer that I had entirely tuned out her voice. I need to call you back. Uh, is everything okay? Another colleague asked. 
This team and I had been working together for a few years now, but they had yet to hear me sound as serious as I did in that moment. It's okay, I'll call you guys right back, I repeated before hanging up. I watched the doe for another few seconds as I dialed. She was closer to my car now, but still a safe enough distance away, about 30 feet, though I felt that was still too close for comfort. Then she stumbled, thrashing on the ground. I was calling the sheriff's office directly, watching with a sinking feeling. The deer was just drooling so much, but she looked gaunt, like she hadn't eaten or drank in a week. I could see drool, so much drool. I listened to the call ring before someone answered. County Sheriff's Office, came a tired voice. I gave the address calmly. I think we need animal control at the west end of the parking lot. There's a deer seizing on the ground over here, just running in circles. It just went down. There was silence for a moment. Are you in a vehicle? Yes, I'm staying inside of it. Good. We're sending someone out right now. Is the animal still in your sight? The once tired voice sounded wide awake now. Alert. Even alarmed. The deer was still flailing about, having thrashed itself a few feet from where it had fallen. I could hear the hooves clattering against the asphalt and concrete base of a light pole as it kicked about. Yes, I plan to keep an eye on it until they arrive. Did the animal appear unsteady? I recalled the circling, the odd cock of the doe's head, the unsteady steps, and I relayed everything down to the drool. I see. Does the animal have any other injuries that you can see? Crack. I winced and gagged at the sound as the doe thrashed her leg too hard against the light pole, I heard the crack through my window, which itself was open just a crack. I averted my gaze to the asphalt beneath the animal to avoid the gut-wrenching sight of the broken leg flopping around. I'm an animal lover, so knowing the animal wouldn't survive the night hit me hard in the gut. In an ideal world, I thought, she could be nursed back to health. But this world is not ideal. It's all cold equations and harsh reality. The humane thing will have to be done in the end. She would have to be euthanized. Ma'am? The operator coaxed. Sorry, I croaked, clearing my throat. <clears> throat> she wasn't... But I, uh... She just broke a leg. She's still thrashing. And it's just kind of... I shuddered at the sound, replaying in my head, bile rising in my throat as I took a deep breath at the guidance of the voice on the phone. I've had friends and dogs with epilepsy over the years so the seizure didn't bother me as much as it may have, but that doesn't mean it's any less disturbing to see one. I saw flashing lights, red and blue. They were coming down the highway, turning in without sirens. I flashed my own lights at the officer before hanging up after confirming I saw him park by the right vehicle. Before parking near my car, he had driven a slow, deliberate circle around the thrashing deer. Then he rolled down his window to talk to me. I recognized him, a regular at the restaurant nearby. He'd been mentoring a friend of mine who was working to become an officer herself. I was glad she wasn't with him tonight. You're looking pale, Badger, he began. I gave a dry, shaking laugh. Can you really blame me? I tilted my head towards the poor creature. He gave a heavy sigh. Light rain began to fall just then, though that wasn't what made my blood run cold. It was what he said next. No, I really can't. You made a good call tonight. There have been three confirmed rabies cases in the area. He looked over to the deer. Looks like this is number four. I learned after he took my report and euthanized the animal there in the lot that rabies doesn't always look like foaming at the mouth. I did get some heat from my supervisor for leaving the call early but there was fast understanding when I submitted the police report to verify my claim. The deer was, in fact, confirmed rapid a few days later by a local vet. A dog bite was found on one of her back legs. Such a scary thought that I was that close to something with an incurable disease, a disease which causes a slow and painful death. Keep your animals up on their shots. 
Stay away from animals that are acting strange. Rabies doesn't care if an animal is out in the middle of nowhere, in your suburban backyard, or near the heart of a bustling city. The reason I quit my job is a pool service technician. From Mike G. 123. Unlike most people who see swimming pools and probably think about warm summer afternoons and sunbathing on a floaty, my mind goes to a darker place. After all, I've had some really weird experiences with one particular pool I cleaned every week during my time as a pool service technician. This story begins in the early spring of 2021, after getting laid off from the first company I worked for due to the pandemic. Being a new parent, I was desperate to find work to support my family. It was no wonder when I jumped on the first job opportunity that came my way. This pool cleaning company had the best reviews in our sizable California town, with a generous starting wage to boot. Being desperate for workers, they quickly hired me on, and I trained under my new supervisor, Ethan. For the first few weeks, I was filling in and cleaning pools wherever they needed me, so I didn't really have a set route, like the rest of the crew. Ethan assured me I'd have a set route once I got the basics of the job down. For those of you who may be thinking that cleaning pools is an easy job, all I'm going to say is that you'd be seriously mistaken. Hauling around heavy chemicals, disassembling, cleaning, and repairing pool plumbing, learning how to perfect the intricate mathematical chemistry formulas for each pool you service, that's just the tip of the iceberg. But I digress. Once I finally had a set route, I'd visit the same group of pools every day, Monday through Friday. I would soon come to dread Thursday in particular for two reasons. Those pools were mostly in the orchards on the outskirts of town, and that route had the Hudgens Pool. Pools located near the orchards became a colossal pain, because they get an absolute ton of dirt and debris in them every year. If that wasn't a reason to hate servicing them enough, let me tell you about the Hudgens Pool. When I first pulled into the Hudgens homestead, I was taken aback by the home's antiquated Victorian-era style. As was customary for all first-time visits at a pool, I headed to the front door and knocked. I introduced myself to the kind old lady who lived there. Pool is located around back, she explained. Ethan has done a good job with it. Water should be nice and blue for you. We shared some small talk, and I thanked her for the hospitality. On my way back to the company truck, it struck me how eerily quiet the area was. With the other orchard properties, I'd hear workers and machinery tending to the trees, cars driving on the road, or at the very least, the singing of birds and other wildlife. All I heard on this property, though, was relentless silence broken only by the crunching of my own footsteps on the gravel pathways. This uneasy silence was a trend that established itself every time I visited the Hudgens Pool. Eventually, I would notice other concerning details. I would sometimes see shadowy figures standing in the upstairs window, like someone was watching me. Sometimes I'd feel these random cold spots whenever I entered the dusty old shed where the pool equipment was located. Even my supervisor, Ethan, made a comment about how unsettling the area made him feel one afternoon, when he had to come out and help me figure out how to take apart the pool filter. While the Hudgens property remained an unsettling place to be all summer, things got much worse during the winter, when daylight began to fade much earlier in the day. I begged and pleaded with Ethan to rearrange my route, so that I might service the Hudgen Pool earlier in the day. But because other pool owners had a particular arrangement, that request never really panned out. So of course, I was stuck servicing the Hudgen's Pool at the end of my route, which would oftentimes be in the waning hours of twilight, when the workload got backed up. One evening in mid-November, I fell really behind on my route. I won't go into details, but... Ethan had to peel off a couple of my pools and assign them to other technicians. Even so, I still got stuck serving the Hudgens pool at the end of my day, 
and it was already dark by the time I got there. Thinking back, that was actually the first time I had to use my flashlight on the job. Now, the only thing worse than a creepy, quiet, orchard property, where you see shadow people watching you from the windows, is the very same property but after dark. If there was any light to be had from the moon that night, it didn't break through the canopy of orchard branches, which left me feeling uneasy about the ocean of pitch black that surrounded the realm beyond the area I worked. Collecting my nerves, I got to work with the usual routine. After checking the water chemistry and inspecting the equipment area for leaks, I moved on to clean the debris baskets in the skimmer. That's when I nearly vomited at the sight of a bloated, decomposing rodent floating in the basket. This would freak out a lot of people if they knew how common an occurrence it was. After collecting the revolting garbage in the skimmer baskets, I turned to walk back to my truck. That's when I noticed the gate surrounding the pool was closed. That's weird, I thought. I could have sworn I left that gate open. I shrugged it off and proceeded to open the gate. After dumping the garbage into my five-gallon bucket trash bin, I turned to head back to the pool, but I froze when I spotted something over by the equipment shed. A figure of a man, just barely illuminated by the nearby wall-mounted light. He stood there staring in my direction. He looked like an older gentleman, from what I could tell. What unsettled me about the man was that he almost seemed translucent, and even though I stood a good dozen or so yards away, it was much too far to make out any facial expressions in the dim light. The man still appeared sad somehow. Before I could wave at him, say hello or do anything to react at all, the figure disappeared in the split second it took me to look down, grab my flashlight, and shine it in that direction. Okay, I thought. I'm stressed out and obviously tired. Let's just hurry up and get this over with. That's what I was telling myself as I slowly began to approach the pool deck. Once I crossed over the gate, my heart nearly exploded out of my chest when that gate slammed shut by itself right behind me. The noise must have alerted Hudgens, because the old gal came through the back patio door faster than what I thought she could manage for her old age. Oh, I'm so sorry about that, she called out apologetically. No, it's okay. I'm sure that clanging thing scared you just as much as it did me. As I got to work, gathering my things to finish up for the night, Hudgens said something that didn't really make sense to me at the time. Oh no, you're fine. My husband might like to play pranks, but he really is quite harmless. The following day, I made it clear to Ethan that I'd need to either service the Hutchins' pool earlier in the day, have it dropped from my route entirely, or I'd be putting in my two weeks' notice. Ultimately, we couldn't work out a reasonable agreement, and my notice was given. While discussing and lamenting the end of my job with the company, Ethan gave me some chilling information which not only gave context to what Hudgens had mentioned the night prior, but made my experience that night all the more terrifying. It's a shame you have to go. It's hard to get Miss Hudgens to trust people with her pull the way she trusted you. I guess nobody can do the job like her husband did when he was still alive. After hearing Ethan drop that bombshell, I flat out refused to go back to the Hudgens' pool. I would later learn that her husband had passed away during the height of the pandemic. These days I work for Amazon, delivering packages to houses not nearly as creepy. Every so often when I find myself in an unsettling location, delivering in the waning hours of twilight, I think back to the Hudgens Pool, and I'm infinitely thankful that the stops on my route only take a minute or two at most. Coffee Brews from Chai I used to work at a small, lovely coffee shop in eastern Colorado, outside the town of Grand Junction. We were one among dozens, but many people seemed to slightly favor our small business, and so we received people from all over. As a barista, I had heard hundreds of stories, stories of love, betrayal, and so much drama 
all of it could keep a small town occupied for years. I heard stories of people's relatives going skiing in Aspen, and people hiking the Book Cliff Mountains only to fall or never be found. I heard so many stories I even began compiling my favorites, and I thought I might tell the one that stuck with me. It was mid-autumn in 2012. I had just started at the coffee shop, and a young man came in as he usually did every Sunday. But this time he seemed rather sullen. Austin, what's wrong? He plopped into a chair at the bar top and ruffled his hair in his hands. I'm just a little shaken today. Do you have the time? I checked the time, and since I was the manager today and the only one on duty, the store would be fine if I listened in on this story. I really liked Austin. He was a fine man who had always been kempt and well-mannered, even when we got his order wrong or the line was ridiculous and he had to wait a while. His Sunday visits had become my favorite part of the job. He would come in and tell me so many amazing stories about his week. He worked as a canine unit in the police force, so he had so many stories every week about drug busts, criminal pursuit, and even him stopping robbers a few times. I would always close for my lunch break and listen in awe. I won't lie, I even developed a small crush on the man, so it only led to further fascination. This was the first time I saw him distraught, so I closed per usual for lunch. I sat with him at the bar, handing him a matcha, and propping my elbows on the bar. So, what's wrong? He took a deep breath. I discharged. What? He looked at me, his hand shaking and his face far paler than normal. My gun. I looked at him in shock and slightly in horror. Austin, what happened? He lost it, tears falling from his eyes, his voice choked as he started. I offered him some napkins, but he couldn't seem to stop rambling and crying at the same time. I was responding to a call. A neighbor called in a welfare check on a couple with two small kids. They'd apparently heard fighting and what they thought were gunshots. I sat there in suspense, listening to the poor man. We arrived. Nobody answered the door. So my partner and I go through the back. It was open. We heard two gunshots, so we raced in because then we had cause. The place was a wreck. I don't think there was one surface that didn't have something shattered on it. The TV was shattered on the ground. The kitchen was a complete wreck, things thrown about everywhere. I took upstairs, while my partner took the first floor and basement. I was stepping over toys, knives, glass, and trash. It stunk in there too, like rot and iron and human waste. I checked the first bedroom. I had to push the door open. There was a body there by the window. He paused a moment seeming to stare into the distance before swallowing. It was a young boy, maybe five. Oh God, I felt sick. I didn't want him to continue, but despite trying to say that, he continued as if he couldn't stop. He'd been shot in the chest. He was gone instantly, probably never even felt it. I went to the other room beside his. There I found his sister and mother. The mother had been... had been gutted. Her insides were all over. The daughter had been shot in the head. As for the mother, she was such a mess, I couldn't even be sure what had killed her in the first place. Besides being gutted, her head had been sawed off with what I could only guess was a pocket knife. Her head was in her lap, the eyes gone. I yelled for my partner and we rejoined in the last bedroom. I'm not proud, I puked in the hallway, and I felt absolutely sick. The husband was waiting in the last room down the hallway, a gun loaded and ready to fire at us. He was covered in blood, and his wife's eyes were on the ground beside him. It looked like he had been eating one of them. He went to fire the weapon, and it missed wildly, because my partner had tackled him. I don't know what this guy was on, but he had wrestled my partner to the ground, taking a chunk from his shoulder with his teeth. I don't even know how, I swear I blinked out. 
I picked up my weapon, yelled at him to back down, and I ended up shooting him in the shoulder. He went down hard. Backup arrived pretty soon after. Backup that my partner had called at some point. My dog was still in the car when they arrived, and he had been going haywire in the seat for a while. His bark was the first thing I could hear as the victims were loaded, and I was taken back to the station to file a report. The man would live, but the rest of them... God, those poor kids. He broke down, violently sobbing. I wish I could have held him then. He said he had only come here because this was the first place where he felt like his routine would be normal, where he would feel normal. He desperately tried to stop shaking. I swallowed hard. There was really nothing I could say. I'd never forgotten how shaken this man was when he told this story. I honestly can't blame him for the shadows that haunt his gaze whenever I see him now. He quit the force a few weeks later. He says therapy is going pretty well. My heart goes out to all law enforcement. I won't take for granted the crazy they have to go through sometimes. After Hours Detail From G. Swain It's been three years now since that night at the shop. I had been running my own mobile auto detailing business for extra income, alongside my 9-to-5 office job. But after what went down at the shop late one evening, I've been more wary than ever about this job. I had set up a bit of an arrangement with an auto mechanic friend named Otto, who let me use one of his garage bays after hours to do interior detailing jobs. It gave me access to water, electricity, and space to thoroughly clean the insides of people's cars when they dropped them off. Usually, I would come right after my day job, around 6 or 7 p.m., and I could knock out one or two vehicles before closing up around midnight. Otto was always gone by the time I arrived, but he knew my routine. I soon became comfortable staying all alone late into the night to get my detailing work done. One night, I got an SUV dropped off late in the day that the owner needed back by morning. It was absolutely filthy inside, with trash strewn about and all manner of sticky grime ground into the carpets and upholstery. I knew this job would take me past midnight, even if I hustled. Sure enough, I was still hard at work long after 11 p.m. Around midnight, I finally got the carpets shampooed, and I moved on to vacuuming and wiping down all the vinyl and leather. I was determined to get this thing showroom ready before I left. Around 12.30, as I was scrubbing away at a particularly tough stain on the back seat, I suddenly heard the side door to the shop open. I froze. No one except Otto had keys, and he never came in this late. The other bays were dark, so I assumed whoever it was would see me and my work lights on and leave. Except I soon heard footsteps approaching my bay. I wasn't too worried at first figuring maybe Otto forgot something. But as the figure stepped into the open bay door, the first thing I noticed was it definitely was not my mechanic friend. This was a man I'd never seen before. Tall and bulky, with messy hair sticking out from under a baseball cap. He looked surprised when he saw me, quickly hiding something behind his back. The situation instantly put me on high alert. I tried not to seem nervous, and spoke up. Uh, can I help you with something? Shop's closed after six. The man cleared his throat and, slurring his words a bit, asked if Otto was there. I replied, reiterating that the shop had closed at six. He lingered another moment, swaying slightly and glancing around my work area. Finally, he stepped back, muttering apologies, as he turned, the hallway light glinted off what looked like a screwdriver handle sticking out of his back pocket. My pulse quickened, but I kept my voice steady as I told him to have a good night. He shuffled off toward the front door. I could no longer see him from there, but I listened intently, hearing it open and close again. Only after I was sure he was gone did I let out a breath that I had been holding in. 
Who was that guy? What was he doing sneaking into a closed shop past midnight? The encounter left me really unsettled. I debated calling the police, but technically the man had not done anything illegal, except maybe trespassing. Plus, I had zero desire to try and explain the whole after-hours garage situation. In the end, I decided to just hurry up and finish my work. About ten minutes later, I was heading over to the mini-fridge we had to grab a bottle of water. The moment I opened up the little fridge door, someone burst out of the storage room behind me. Before I could react, they grabbed me, putting me into a chokehold. The next thing I knew, something cold and metal was pressed against my throat. I struggled hard to break free as this man growled at me, telling me to be quiet and to do what he said. My mind raced, thinking he was either going to rob me or worse. For just a second, his grip loosened, so I stomped as hard as I could on his foot and twisted away. He let go of me, and I saw for sure then that that was the same man who had walked in earlier, and what he had pressed to my throat was that screwdriver. I tried to run for the exit, but he tackled me from behind. The two of us crashed into a tool cabinet, tools spilling everywhere. As I flailed about, trying to push him off, my hand landed on a wrench. I gripped it tight, and I swung it at him with all my might, knocking it against his temple. He cried out, rolling off of me. I scrambled up, stumbling for the hallway. My only thought was getting outside, where I could hopefully flag down some help. Suddenly, I heard his heavy footsteps behind me again. He didn't stay down long. I burst through the side door out into the parking lot. The area was deserted. Most businesses on the block closed for the night. I ran to the middle of the lot, scanning desperately around for any sign of people. The man followed me out, one hand pressed to his bleeding head wound. Seeing that I had nowhere to go, he snarled and started stalking towards me again, raising that screwdriver. Just then, a truck pulled into the lot, its headlights blinding the man. I waved my arms wildly, shouting for help. The truck driver got out, startled by the chaotic scene. When the man tried to go for me again, the driver tackled him to the ground, holding him down until police arrived. I then went over to help. I think that driver saved my life that night. I explained everything to Otto, and even he wasn't sure who this man was. There's something terrifying in not knowing why someone wanted to harm you. Luckily, this did convince Otto to install some security cameras around the building. I still do my detail work there, but these days I prefer not to stay too long. Late Night at the Office From Ryan I've always been the type to stay late at the office, but one particular night forever changed my perspective on work. It was a stormy evening, rain pelting against the windows, as I hunched over my desk, trying to meet an impossible deadline. The rest of the office had long emptied out, leaving me alone with the relentless ticking of the clock and the flickering fluorescent lights. As I typed away, the overhead lights began to sputter erratically. I muttered a few choice words under my breath and tried to ignore it. But then I heard it, the soft, muffled sound of footsteps. I froze, as I was previously convinced I was alone in the building. I strained my ears, trying to discern the source of the noise. It seemed to be coming from the corridor just outside my office. My heart pounded in my chest as the footsteps drew nearer, each step slow and deliberate. Fear knotted in my stomach as I realized there was no logical reason for anyone to be here at this hour. I hesitated for a moment, debating whether to investigate or stay hidden. Curiosity, or perhaps sheer stupidity, got the better of me. I grabbed a heavy stapler from my desk, clutching it like a makeshift weapon. I then cautiously made my way to the door. The corridor was eerily silent now, the footsteps having ceased. I inched forward, my heart still pounding, 
and I peered out into the dimly lit hallway. No one was there, but the air felt charged with some unnatural energy. I could feel eyes on me, though I couldn't see anyone. With trembling hands, I stepped further into the corridor, the darkness seeming to close in around me. And then I saw it, a flicker of movement at the far end of the hallway. A shadow-like figure emerged from the darkness, its face obscured. My breath caught in my throat as I raised the stapler defensively. Who's there? Who's there? I stammered, my voice quivering. The figure didn't respond. It simply advanced, its movements unnaturally fluid. Panic surged through me as I turned to retreat, but it was too late. Another figure had appeared behind me, trapping me in that corridor. I was surrounded, helpless, as these two shadowy figures closed in on me. Their presence was suffocating, intentions unknown. I squeezed my eyes shut, my mind racing with terror. Suddenly, the lights overhead flickered, then blazed to life, revealing a now empty corridor. The figures were gone, leaving me shaken and disoriented. I stumbled back to my office, grabbing my belongings and fleeing the office building. To this day, I can't explain what happened that night. All I know is that I'll never stay late at work again if I can avoid doing so. And I'll forever be haunted by the memory of those sinister, uninvited guests in the office corridor. What even were they? Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. Dot com.